children's ministry, if you're praying about becoming involved in children's ministry, or if you're even thinking about beginning to pray about (laughs) being involved in children's ministry, we'd invite you to a meeting right after second service in the fellowship hall. We'll have lunch together, and then we're just going to kind of let everyone know what's going on in children's ministry. It'll be a good time of fellowship together. That's always kind of the first part and the fun part is fellowship. And then we'll give a little encouragement from the word and then kind of an update on how things are going and how they ought to go. With children's ministry, we mentioned uh, probably, I don't know, four Sundays ago that we're at the point that we are really praying about doing more children's ministry first service. Um, We haven't really done that for like two or three years now since things kind of changed around. Um, We've only been doing children's ministry ministry second service, but uh, we've had a few Sundays now where there's been over 50 kids, nursery to fifth grade. And so it, it kind of presents some issues, right? Like just, just space issues, um, distractions from like when you, when you have a class of like 18, uh, four to five year olds that you can't even get a lesson in because the restrooms are just like, it's, it's just, it's just, they're always going. So we want to be in prayer for that. And we're going to talk about that at the children's ministry meeting. Um, so again, we've just been praying. Um, our, our heart would be to, we, like, we kind of do think we're ready. Uh, we, we really sense the Lord's given us some, some direction on getting started with something, this coming unit, which would be towards the end of September. So, but just continue to pray, please, for the children's ministry. So even if you're like, I, I'm probably not going to get involved in children's ministry, you can be involved by praying. Uh, for us as a ministry. So there, there's that. And then also this Sunday is the first choir practice. So uh, some of you in here are going to help with the choir part. Come have lunch first and just eat quickly. And I think it's one o'clock in here, right? For the So we'll start in there at like 12, 15, 12, 30. So you'll have a little bit of time to eat at least. And then you'll come here and then get to yell at the kids and get them in line and uh, <laughs> all that kind of stuff and get them going on the choir. But it's going to be a wonderful time. It's going to be a great outreach uh, that we're going to do the Christmas play and the choir and we'll do it the Saturday before Christmas here I think Christmas Eve is on a Sunday so I I'm thinking we're going the full week before that will be the Christmas play and just a real opportunity to invite friends and family to come out you know sometimes they won't come to church just like just straight church but if it's a Christmas play that their nephew's in or something like that sometimes people will come to church for that so it will be an outreach and so we'll be praying for that as well um, if you could So, okay, so uh, last week we began the study of the tabernacle. It would be the place where God would meet with his people. We saw so many pictures and types of Christ and and New Testament pictures of our relationship uh, with God. Remember, though, that this this offering, this system of, of sacrifice and offering comes after the deliverance. It comes after the law of God is given. So you remember it's salvation first then sanctification. That's the way it goes. People don't clean themselves up and then come to God. God delivers them. God saves them. And then sanctification, becoming more like Christ, happens after that. We talked about the different metals and the colors and the offering that was going to be offered. And um, I do like this quote from a guy named Dunham. He said, some writers strain at seeing a type in everything. And we don't want to strain in that fashion, nor do we want to be dogmatic because the Old Testament itself does not spell out the symbolism. So, so for something, uh, what, what do we usually repeat that phrase? The main things are the plain things and the plain things the main things. There are some things that just about every commentator would agree on and most uh, uh, people agree on. And the gold, you know, that we'll see. So we're going to see gold and silver and, and bronze or brass or, 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 or some say it would be copper, you know, uh, or brazen. Uh, anyways, you, you see those metals and then you see blue thread and purple thread and scarlet thread, and then you see uh, acacia wood. And and when you see all these things, uh, the gold, most would say, uh, agree that it speaks to the deity uh, or the deity, uh, you know, of Christ. The silver looks at redemption. Uh, We'll we'll see that atonement money uh, come up in Exodus 30. Uh, The brass or the bronze speaks to judgment. The blue uh, is the heavenly uh, color showing that that's, you know, that Christ came from the heaven. The purple speaks of royalty. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The scarlet uh, or red is is associated with sacrifice. And then that acacia wood uh, speaks of 
that impenetrable, kind of unable to be um, like compromised by sin. It's that really hard wood uh, that we see. It's a good picture of Jesus. And so last week uh, we looked at the box, right? The 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 Ark of the Covenant that uh, about 45 inches by 27 by 27, made of acacia wood, covered by gold. Um, Inside of it, they put the Ten Commandments, and so we see pictures of Jesus right off the bat. This this acacia wood, this hard or not corrupted or able to be corrupted by insects, and as a picture of Jesus, that he was a man, yet he was uncorrupted by sin. And some mention that it also speaks to Jesus in that you see the indestructibility of the wood that he withstood the the crucifix, crucifixion and the decaying effects of the grave. Uh, And then the gold speaks of his deity, that Jesus was 100% man, we know, but he was 100% God as well. And as God, he's, you know, eternal and uh, omnipresent and omnipotent and, uh, and omniscient. And so the wood and the gold together shows the merging of Jesus's divine and his human natures. And, um, and, uh, Again, Levy says this, the ark uh, in the Holy of Holies was symbolic of the Lord's glory in two ways. First, as the ark dwelt among mankind, so Jesus was manifested to mankind during his earthly pilgrimage. And second, the ark, uh, as the ark represented the throne of God where he manifested his glory, so Christ is seated at the right hand of God in all his glory. And so, and in all that, you remember one of the things we talked about is that that ark, in all its glory, in all its beauty, sat right there on the ground, uh, and we see Jesus, that he put on flesh, dwelt among us, walked among us. Uh, Jesus, you know, wasn't just this polished, uh, fine uh, politician separated from people. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners and fishermen. He called them to repentance, Um, and so uh, also about the ark, um, it's it's a picture of the presence of God. And, and it's carried by priests with these poles. Do you remember it's on those, there's the rings and the poles uh, that hold it and it, it's to be carried about, not, you don't touch it, you don't touch it, God is holy, right? There is that separation between God and his people. It's carried on these poles. Part of the reason too with the poles, they were a pilgrim people. They, were, they, they went from place to place and they had to have a way to carry it around. We talked about it doesn't go on a cart and stuff like that. And for us today, the presence of God uh, is carried around around the world today by a kingdom of priests, right? That the, the Bible says that we are a kingdom of priests, that we are people who represent God to people and we represent the people to God in prayer, right? And so we go around with that priestly ministry today and show the world uh, who, who God is. And so that was the Ark of the Covenant that gets us caught up to where we are today. We'll start in verse 17. Tonight, we're going to look at the mercy seat. We're going to look at the table of showbread, and we're going to look at the lampstand uh, tonight. And I, there will come a point, I might ask Thomas, maybe not on all of them, but I might. We'll see for sure on one. I might get a picture up there. I don't usually teach with pictures, so we'll see how this goes. Because it's easy to get distracted with the pictures. And so that sometimes that happens. Because then I'm looking at the picture the whole time. I don't even know what's going on. Okay. All right. The mercy seat. Okay. Verse 17, it says, And you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of uh, it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And and in the ark, you shall put the testimony that I will give you. Verse 22, and there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the Ark of the Testimony, about everything which I will give you uh, in commandment to the children of Israel. Father, as we just look at your word, we pray that you would make the book just come alive to us, Lord, that you would show us who you are. Show us, Lord, who we are in the light of who you are. 
And Lord, just speak to us tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So he says, you make the mercy seat, verse 17, of pure gold. Two and a half cubits uh, is the length. Cubit and a half its width, so about 45 long, 45 inches long by 27 wide. Um, You'll see that those are the exact dimensions of the top of the Ark of the Covenant. Why? It's a perfect lid. It's a perfect fit. And, you know, it's not half the size of the Ark. It's not even 99% the size of the Ark. It's 100% sinful man needs a complete and pure and total mercy between us and the demands of the law of Moses. It has to be complete. It can't be partial. It's the only way we could stand next to the law is if there's mercy between us. And so you see that there's going to be this solid piece, and, and he gets into describing uh, what that looks like. Um, it, it's it, they're cherubim that are going to be, it's all going to be one piece. So it's one solid, this is pretty big and pretty heavy, right? That it's got to be kind of thick enough to actually sit there and it's going to have the two angels, cherubim, they're angels, right? That, and the wings are going to come over the top. And if you kind of follow through how this is going to be going, it's, it's, it's a hammered work. They're at the two ends, uh, one cherub on one end, another cherub on the other end. It says that you make them at the two ends and it's one piece with the mercy seat. There's not wood in this one. This is just pure gold. Um, and, and so, you know, it's beautiful, you know, no doubt the cherubim, they stretch out their wings above, it says to where they touch over the top. Uh, and it says they face one another, right? So, you know, you got the wings and the, the I don't know. There's, you know, there, just Google it. There's a zillion pictures. Everyone's got a different kind of interpretation, but, th- but some of them, they say, they, they show pictures and the wings aren't even touching. Did you read it? It says they're touching, you know? So, Anyways, and so they face one another, but the faces of the cherubim shall be towards the mercy seat. So, so even though they, they, their bodies are facing one another, the, the wings over touching, but the faces are looking down, down toward that ark where the law would be. Okay. You... you you could show the one picture, Thomas. Go ahead. Let's see if that works. That, maybe. We, we don't know exactly. We don't know exactly, but that's kind of the idea that, that the faces, and I don't even know if those are facing down enough. Maybe the eyes are. I don't know, but they're facing down. The wings are touching. I pictured the wings coming over the top myself, but the pictures of those, they weren't touching, so I couldn't use that one. So anyways... And he says this in verse 21, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I give you. And so the mercy seat serves as that lid. Under the lid are the tablets of the law that God would give Moses. So all of this, this is where God's going to meet with his people. This is where God's going to talk to his people. The presence of God is going to be there when the guy gets in there to minister before the Lord. And this is where business is going to happen. And so it's a, it's a real big deal because God says there in verses, in verse 22, he says, there I will meet with you and I will speak with you. So he says he's meeting and speaking here and that mercy seat or that atonement cover, some call it, or the place of propitiation. It, it's where God met with Israel in the sense that he met with the representative of Israel, the high priest, in peace because of the atoning blood on the day of atonement. And we'll get more into that when we get to Leviticus chapter 16. But, but about this high priest, God was going to meet with his people here. And the priest, and we'll get into this later, this would be a real sobering deal because this Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat would be behind that veil in the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, right? So if you're coming in, you have the two-thirds of it is the holy place, and you would have the lampstand and the showbread and the altar of incense in there. Then you go through the veil, and it's just this in there. And he's going to go in there. One guy goes in there one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And we'll get into later all all his garments that are for glory and for beauty. But on the bottom of that garment, on the hem, would would be a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, and all this stuff. There would be noise when he moved around. And this was for a couple reasons, right? And we'll get into some of those reasons later. 
But one reason was so that people would know that he's still alive in there. This is a holy God. He's doing business for all the whole nation, for the sin of the nation. Before he'd even go in there, he had to make sacrifice for himself and his family before he could make sacrifice for, on behalf of the people and then go in there and do business with God to atone for their sins on that day. And, and so then church history would tell us and, and history shows us that, that at some point they go, we got to tie a rope around his foot. At some point, we got to put a rope on that guy's foot when he goes in there because if we stop hearing those bells, in some way or another, he, he has displeased God. Whatever he took in there that was not clean, God smote him. And so who's going to go get him? I'm not going to get him. Or, you, you know, you're not going to go get him behind that veil. So they'd put a rope on his foot. And if they really stopped hearing the noise or heard a thump, you know, and then no noise, it's like, all right, let's get him out of there. So, so this is a, this is a, a, a big uh, deal. And again, why the mercy seat? Because in the ark is the law. And the law of Moses was perfect. We know that. The Bible tells us that it is perfect. But the problem is that we cannot keep the law. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, calls it the ministration of death. That it was glorious, he says, of the law. And he says, you know, and if the law was glorious, how much more so the ministry of the Spirit, right? That where it happened in Romans chapter 7, Paul said that he was alive without the law, but, but the commandment came and, and then it condemned him once he knew all that sin was. In Romans chapter 6, we're told that the wages of our sin is death. We can't keep the Ten Commandments. We can't keep the law of God. The standard for entrance into heaven is perfection, and we could never live up to that, and we could never lose sight of the fact that we cannot earn our way into heaven. So if someone says, you know, you think you're going to heaven? Yeah, sure, I, I keep the Ten Commandments. No, you don't. No one does. Not on your best day, you can't. Just read the first one. It's over. You can't, you can't, and so then, then we say this, well, 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 we need God to provide a way for us to get in. And we, we kind of joked about this last time, well, how about he just grade on a curve and lower the bar, but we can't do that. Why? Because then you go, where do we draw the line? What's the curve? And, and... And you hear it when, whenever you talk to people, right, who, who want to somehow, some way justify themselves before God. Well, well I don't, I've never killed anybody. Okay, so is that the line then? Do, so we pick out of the Ten Commandments and go, well, this one's more valuable then. Well, God didn't do that. He, he said them all just the same. But, but people would do that and... <laughs> We, God wouldn't say it, we can't say it, that one's more important than the other because then we start doing like some kind of tricky math, don't we? They're like, okay, no murder, no murder in heaven, but, um, and, well, what about adultery? And you're like, oh gosh, well, some people make mistakes, you know, geez, you know, okay, one, you get one. And then, you, and then the people who didn't plan on doing it are going, what, you get one? You know how people are, they go, how close to the line can I get? How many Lord's name in veins do you get? You go, well, you know, sometimes when you hit your finger with the hammer, you might say something you didn't mean to say. So maybe get, you know, a few of those, you know. And, and people will start grading on the curve. You go, well, anybody may. And then, well, covetous. Well, you get like nine covets, you know. And then, and then you know, some, I, you know, I kind of played this whole thing out for a while. And then someone kind of pops in and goes, well, wait a second. I'm from America. There... <laughs> The whole economy is based on covetousness. Like, what do you do? Okay, well, now we got a grade for the location that you come from. And it just doesn't work that way. There's no way that we can begin to ask God to, to grade on the curve when it comes to getting into heaven. There's no way that we can go, or, that, or even worse, that we could speak on God's behalf and say which ones are okay to get into heaven. Oh, you know, ev yeah, everyone does. That. No way. We cannot in any way, shape, or form like, like lower that bar and say, okay, go ahead. The line is either perfection or there's no line at all. Heaven is not heaven if all the junk from earth is allowed in. 
And so either we're left out and God remains just, or we're all let in and God isn't just. But with a place of mercy, God remains just. There is no way anyone can say that God is soft on sin because he, because he finds a way to deal with sin and finds a way to justify us, not on the basis of who we are, but on the basis of his mercy, of his not giving us what we deserve, right? Perfect justice, getting what you deserve. Mercy, not getting what you deserve. And we only get that in the sacrifice of another, not on our own merit. We need a savior, right? So something has to die in that place. And so when he says, and there I will meet with you, God met with Israel in the sense that he met with the representative of Israel, the high priest, in peace, right? We talked about that. It was as if God, looking down from his dwelling place between the cherubim, saw the ark, saw the law in the ark, and knew we were guilty of breaking his law, but atoning blood of sacrifice was sprinkled onto the mercy seat so that God saw the blood covering uh, the breaking of his law and forgiveness could then be offered. That's wild. It's that picture, God looking down, seeing his perfect law, knowing that we're near that, we're nothing to it. So in between is that mercy seat. And we see this institution now where an innocent animal will be sacrificed for the sins of the people. But then what happens? We get to Hebrews and we're told that the blood of bulls and the blood of goats was not enough to take away sin. We need a greater sacrifice, which would have to be something that would not just cover sin, but take it away. And it has to be greater, not only greater than the life of an animal, but even greater than a human life if it's going to save a person. And so in Romans chapter 3, the Greek word for propitiation, and I'm not a Greek guy, but I, I'll, I'll just read it in English, but it's this word, uh, hilasterion, H-I-L, if you're spelling it, H-I-L-A-S-T-E-R-I-O-N, hilasterion. It's also the same that's used in the Septuagint, which is the early translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek. So it's the same word used for mercy seat. Therefore, it can, rightly, it can be rightly said that Jesus is our mercy seat. He is the place and the means of our redemption. And this word propitiation has the idea of gifts, of, of presenting a gift to, a, you know, a lowercase God so as to turn away displeasure of those gods. And the Greeks thought of it in a sense of a man essentially bribing the gods, a lowercase, uh, into doing favors for man. But the Christian idea of propitiation is that God himself presents himself in Jesus Christ as that which will turn away his righteous wrath against our sin. So if there's ever a question of Jesus go, or of God going soft on sin, we just look at the cross. There's no way that we can say that God went soft on sin. He punished his son for what we deserve, for the sin that we deserved. And so this guy Alfred on propitiation said the word implies that Christ has, as our sin offering, reconciled God and us by nothing else but but by his voluntary death and sacrifice and has, by, and has by this averted God's wrath from us. That's a big deal. So when he says, I'll meet you at the mercy seat, I'll speak to you at the mercy seat, that's where it gets dealt with. Not because we're good enough, right? So the people having the 10 commandments, or having circumcision, or having any of these things that later they would identify and say, no, I'm good with God because of that. No, that's not why you're good with God. You're good with God because he's merciful, because he has covered our sins, not because we cover them, not because I live better than the next guy, right? We've talked about that a hundred times, right? That it's like, if I compare myself to you or you to me, we'll find ways that I'm better than you and you're better than me. We don't compare ourselves to one another. We compare ourselves to the holy standard that God has set forth. That's where we set ourselves. And so with all these things, we go, I need mercy. I need the mercy of God to forgive me. And so on nights like tonight, man, when, we, when we're reminded of this, we go, oh, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord that he would see me on the basis of his mercy. 
and that he didn't lower the standard. He didn't, he didn't, you know, sacrifice, you know, how great heaven is by just letting anyone in. No, he took it out on his son. And what do we do? We put our faith and trust in him. And then what does he do? He doesn't just go, okay, I'll cover it for another year. No, he wipes away our sins, past, present, and future in his eyes. He imputes to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But then not only that, he makes us a new creation. He gives us a new nature. He fills us with his Holy Spirit and gives us the power to now walk in this life and not be slaves to what we used to be slaves to. Hallelujah. Right? Isn't that wonderful news? And so when he says the mercy seat, man, it's a really, it's a really big thing. And now, okay, so now we get to the table of, uh, of showbread here. Verse 23, no, 23, yeah, of course I wrote something wrong. I wrote 25, that's fine. 23 to 30. He says, you shall make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold, make a molding of gold all around. You shall make for its frame uh, you shall make for it a frame of a handbreadth all around, and you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. You shall make for it four rings of gold. Put the rings on the four corners that are uh, at its four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold uh, and you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. Okay, what does that mean? So you got this table. It's about 18 inches wide, about 36 inches long, about 27 inches tall. It's made of acacia wood. It's overlaid with gold. It's got a molding all around it. It says it says that uh, that for, uh, make a frame of about a hand breadth all around and a gold molding. A hand breadth uh, it, they they say is about four fingers. So so you know somewhere around four inches. You know so you have this little ledge uh, that's around it. Again, it's going to have the four rings of, of gold and, and the poles that are going to go through uh, to, to bear the table and to carry it. So same as the ark, right? It'll be carried uh, by the poles. And then it says that you shall make the dishes, uh, the pans, the pitchers, the bowls for pouring, make them out of pure gold. You get more of this in Leviticus 23 uh, and 24. Uh, but but um, the, the pans would be for carrying the bread, the pitchers and the bowls for the drink offering that would go with and, and the spoons that, that would be made to pour the frankincense on top of the bread. And like I said, we'll get more into that when we get to uh, Leviticus. But um, it, uh, then in verse 30, it says, and you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. And so on the table of showbread, there would be these 12 loaves of showbread. And literally the, the translation could be the bread of faces. And so this bread was associated with and to be eaten before the face of God. The table or the meal speaks to fellowship that people were to be in constant communion with God. Some talk of how the bread is necessary, that bread is necessary for survival, and that fellowship with God is just as necessary for man, right? You need daily bread for survival. You need fellowship with the Lord on a daily basis. So the table, again, made of acacia wood, and with gold speaks to Jesus, and the bread on it speaks of fellowship with him. And, and you know, to think of this, it, like in any relationship, um, it's not a one-time deal. It's not even a, a once-a-week type of deal. Think of any relationship that's kind of worth anything. Uh, if you just talk once and never again, it's not much of a relationship. If you just talk once a week, it's going to be a difficult relationship, right? You need to have that, that constant fellowship regularly. And so when we accept Jesus, it's not just a one-time deal. They're like, hey, Jesus, thanks for this salvation. I'll go ahead and go live like I always lived before. It doesn't work that way. 
that constant fellowship with him. And again, it's not, uh, I, it's not the healthiest thing to even come to church twice a week. That's good. Uh, you know, we get fellowship. We get instructed in the word. But, but that daily walk with him, that, that daily idea of, of being with him. And in John chapter 6, Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life who came down from heaven to give his life to everyone who accepts him. And uh, according to Leviticus 24, the, the showbread was made of, of fine flour and 12 cakes of showbread, uh, one for each of the, of the tribes of Israel, was set on a table. It was sprinkled lightly with frankincense and once a week the bread was replaced uh, and normally only priests uh, could eat the showbread. We see one exception um, earlier in the, in, uh, and you see that. We'll get, we'll get to Samuel. I don't know when we'll get to Samuel. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever get back there on Thursday nights. It's, uh, we'll be all pretty old by then. Um, but th- but there, there's that. So, so the fellowship with the Lord. Uh, and then we get to the lampstand, uh, verse 31 uh, through 39. It says, You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work, its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs, and flowers shall all be of one piece. And six branches shall come out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of the one side and three branches of the lampstand on the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and three bowls made like an almond blossom on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower. And so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand, on the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first Uh, two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand, their knobs and their branches shall be one piece, Uh, 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 all of it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold, you shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in uh, front of it. And its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all its utensils. Thomas, we'll just go straight to the picture on this one. <laughs> what, what's he talking about, right? You're just like, okay, wait, where was the almond blossom? And where was the, you know, where, what, you know, I think it was that verse, what, verse 35 where it's like, and there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same and under uh, the second two branches of the same. And, and uh, uh, I think it was in verse 33 where it says, three bulls shall be made like the almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and the three bulls. Okay, so that you see the idea though, right? It, so there's that, the one that goes up straight and then you got, you got three on each side, but, but, the, but the, the two inner ones, that's one piece going like that one piece, right? Okay, so we, so we get it. We've seen this. We've, this is not, um, it sounded like rocket science when we were reading it, but it's not. <laughs> there's times I'm like, God, you had to have given him some kind of vision with this too. Like you had to have shown him. Like, I, I don't know. I, well, I'm, I'm zero artistic. So I read this, I'm like, Let's, let's find a picture. The lampstand was, a, was hammered out of pure gold, and, and no specific dimensions are given, but, uh, but it's after the, the pattern of, of the modern day, what we call the menorah. And so it had that one middle shaft there with three branches coming out of each side. The total comes to seven lamps. Um, some say that the repetition of the almond blossom was important because the almond was the first tree to blossom in the springtime. It reminded everyone of new life and the fresh nature of God's ongoing work. I don't know. We can say that now. I don't know 100% that every person in Israel go, oh, that's exactly what we think of is the almond is the first thing that comes in the spring. Again, some of these things the people would do just out of obedience to God. And I think that's okay right? There are times in our life that we're like, God, why? Like, why does it have to be just so? And, and it, it's okay that God says, because I've said it to be so. 
That really is okay. God knows better than us. His ways are above our ways. He knows better than we know. And so I think there, there could be some people in Israel go, why does it have to look like that? Like, I don't get it. I don't get why it has to be just like that. And, and God goes, it, 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 not everything is for you to understand. Some things belong to the Lord. And some things, you know, when we get to heaven and, and we watch the, you know, DVD series, you know, when we get there and see the whole thing, and we're like, oh, God, that's, and, and he's the one explaining right there, going, this is exactly why it happened. This, oh, okay, gosh, that makes perfect sense now, right? That, that, that now I know just as I also am known. We'll get to that point. But sometimes on this side of eternity, we don't always get that. So, so again, some commentators can say, oh, of course, it reminded everyone of the, of, the, of the new life and fresh nature of God's ongoing work. Oh, it makes sense now that you said it. And, and maybe God did give that specific word to specific guys, and they were able to give it to the people. But I don't know that everybody would get it uh, just like that. And so, again, a little confusing. The photo uh, kind of helps, but, but um, yeah. <laughs> It was made, though, verse 39 says, out of a talent of pure gold. Now, this is also something that's not completely agreed upon by everybody. The lowest number I saw that would be say that this would be about 25 pounds. That's pretty big. Like, that's a pretty serious lampstand. But you figure, when you walked in to the tent, right, you've got that two-thirds portion. It's not very big. You would walk it. That would be the only light source on that side of the veil in, in the two-thirds part. That's the only light source. So, but you figure that this thing's made of pure gold. The other stuff in there is overlaid with gold. That once those lights are on, boy, it's probably pretty bright in there. Then you have the veil, and then in, inside, there's no light source on the other side of the veil. Just the, art, just the glory of God's in there, right? That's going to be pretty bright, too, I'll tell you, I bet you, right? And so... so now, some say 25 pounds. Some say as high as 125 pounds. That's pretty heavy, too. Uh, that's pretty big. Um, more people that I saw kind of landed between that 75 and 90 pounds, even that. That's incredible. <laughs> and so I don't know how big that thing was or wasn't. Again, no specifics for us, at least. Um, they would know that. And so the lampstand... Um, providing the only light in the tabernacle besides the glory of the Lord on the other side of the veil, speaks to Jesus as the light of the world and that he provides the way to God. A couple verses, and, and you don't have to turn there, you could if you'd like, um, in John chapter 8, verse 12. In John chapter 8, verse 12 it says Jesus spoke to them again and he said I am the light of the world he who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life and then in 1 John if you take note of it or you could you could write it down or you could turn there but in 1 John chapter 1 as he's talking about you know fellowship between us and how our fellowship is truly in the Lord Jesus. He says, this is the message, uh, 1 John 5, 1 John 1, 5, this is the message which we have heard f from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus is the light. We walk in that light. And so, you know, as we look at these things uh, in the tabernacle, and I think, I really do think, uh, <laughs> you might not believe it, we'll see. Uh, that from here on, we'll probably move a little quick, uh, a little more quickly uh, through next, next week. We're going to look at a lot of the, of the, of the, the boards and, and, the, and the bars and the sockets and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the tapestry and the way it's all, you know, woven together and stuff and what that speaks to. But I think it'll go a little faster. But with all of it, it's so beautiful to live on this side of the cross and, and have the full canon of Scripture that we can hold in our laps and see who God is and the plan of salvation. And, and, you know, for me, just tonight going, Lord, thank you for your mercy. Like, I don't deserve to be next to God. I don't deserve to be near to God or to be able to even talk to Him. And the fact that He invites us in because of what He's done for us. 
and all that's that for us it's like just accept it receive it and then walk in it right and then allow him to change us you know day by day from the inside out so uh let's go ahead and pray father we just thank you so much for who you are